Good morning. Happy Thursday. I have neural coffee in hand and it is perfect. I've just been trying to understand what happens in terms of expansion in the body with nutation and counter nutation. Uh -huh. And I've just been having trouble conceptualizing like where there's free space and where the guts are going. Okay. So. So what do you think so far? Well, it, what I'm not understanding is like, I feel like if I'm dipping into nutation, wouldn't that then just push everything forward and down or no, because it's not really, I mean, it's compressing down. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure if, if the axis of the change the expansion would go in the opposite way. So I like, uh, you used a word that I really, really like. So the pelvis has an axis. The, the picture on the left is, is, is the, the pelvic axis, the green arrow. You see it? Mm -hmm. Shake your head, okay. Um, and so, so that would be some measure of an in-between <clears throat> kind of a thing, okay? And so, mm -hmm. You've got the you've got the vertical pressures. You got the pelvic axis, and then if if I if I nutate um, the the sacrum, and I, I've exaggerated in, in the picture for effect here, you 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 redirect the the pelvic axis. So now that blue arrow becomes the new pelvic axis. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. and so so when when you think about um, the outlet. So basically you're reorienting the direction of the outlet. So if I lift, if I, if I move the, let's stop this, Just share for a second. So if I do that, right, you gotta look at where I actually created space. So the, so the, the, the anterior outlet becomes concentrically oriented and, and will elevate. So it creates pressure upward, but I'm nutated there. And so I'm gonna follow the path of least resistance. Okay. And mm -hmm. so, so under these circumstances, this is, this is why you, you get hip flexion during certain types of exercises versus like a, like a straight down descent. So that what, what people would say would be like, like the difference between like an RDL and a squat, right? So the RDL is, is more nutated and that's why your, your behind moves backwards. Um, because literally the, the guts are going to follow the path of least resistance. And so where mm. the direction of the expansion is where you will move. Okay. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Totally. Okay. Now, so, so you've also got, you've also got the, the consideration that you've got a, um, the pelvic floor muscles are pushing upward at the same time. Okay. okay. So you got, well, you got pubo rectalis, pubo coccygeus, ilia, uh, uh, ilia, is it ilia coccygeus, um, and uh, obturator. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so they're concentrically oriented and they're pushing up. And so the, so, so while, while you have an element of expansion in that, that, that posterior aspect that's allowing the, the pelvis to move backwards, I also have pressure going upward. So they, so the guts have to go somewhere. Okay. Now, if you're if you're uh, if you're nutated and under normal circumstances that would be an exhalation, right? Um, so I would be I would be exhaling, I would be compressing, and then so the, the guts would move up and forward, all right. If we're going to talk about like a compensatory strategy though, um, where like if, if you have somebody that has a wide infrasternal angle. And they're using a compensatory breathing strategy. They have a concentric um, thoracic diaphragm because of, of their their breathing strategy, right? So they they cheat to breathe in by pulling their diaphragm down into concentric orientation. So now I have concentric going up. I have concentric going down. Can you see it? Shoves everything forward. How about that? Yeah. Exactly right. And, 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 and it's, and it's a great way to express it because it's, it's, this is not, this is not uh, the, a, a passive response. This is like, okay, I'm pushing down, I'm pushing up. I only have so much space to go down and back with the rest has to push out the front. And so this is where you get the really lean guys with the six pack, but they got kind of like the round belly. Mm. 
right? Because they're compressed, but the guts have to go somewhere. Easiest place, I can't go back through the spine. It's really hard to do that, right? And so, so they end up going, again, they're gonna follow the path of least res resistance. And so you get this, like literally, it's like the guys are jacked and they got this, this kind of roundness to the, to the abdomen because the, the guts have to move somewhere, right? I okay. think that makes sense because the the axis of the the expansion really would shift kind of in line with the shape. Exactly. I was just I was just having exactly trouble. right. That is exactly yeah. right. Okay. And so so now you've got now you've got a really good understanding. It's like so so they're kind of walking around in the in this orientation like okay, they're deadlifting 24/7. So now think about, so, so now you kind of know where the expansion is going to be, right? Where's the compression? On the opposites. Yeah. So now they walk in, they go, yeah, my back really hurts, Bill. <laughs> and th this is, this is why, this is why the archetypes matter. This is why the compensatory breathing strategies matter. And, th and then you're, you're just seeing this, this progressive reduction of adaptability, right? And then look for look for where where they cannot alleviate that pressure. Am I good to go yet, or <laughs> go for it? <laughs> as, as, as soon as Grace gives you permission, you're good to go. <laughs> and so, if the ISA is almost like a proxy measure for the adaptability of the easiest, e the most easily moved ribs, right? And the top rib, the first rib, is the most difficult to affect. Is there a proxy measure to measure the the change there? Like, does the collarbone which, which and change, this, which, which change are we talking about? Just like uh, whether you're going from like a like a like about, so like a narrow it. to a wide or like a a positional change. Yes. So, like, does the collarbone and the superior border of the scap form some sort of angle, or is that like <laughs> is that a thing or no? Does anybody want to take this one? Does anybody want? Does anybody want to take it? I refuse to call it by the name that we're gonna try to term it as, because he'd get to. <laughs> you're you're okay. not allowed. You're not allowed to have an exercise and and a, and an angle. Is that is that basically the yeah, rule? It you know, can't work. <sighs> so yeah, so Lucas, there there there's an angle there. There's a very specific angle, in fact. Um, so we we. Uh, we call it the Camperini angle just because I don't want anything named after anybody. And so I just kind of make fun of Campo. And so anything that comes up that we have to give a name to, I name it after him. Um, so, so that the angle between the clavicle and, and, and the, the scapula, right? Yeah. On average, on average, it's going to be about 60 degrees. Okay. Yeah. And do you have a standardized way of measuring it? Like, yeah, uh, I go, I go like that. All right, like, all right. Right. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. But, gotcha. but, but, but let me offer you, let me offer you this. It's like, so there are measures that are going to be associated with, with a narrowing of that angle. So, so think about, think about what would happen to, to, to close it. So to move the clavicle back and the scapula forward, there's stuff in the way. Right, so I have I have the I have the upper rib cage, I have air volume, etc. Right, and so for for the for that angle to actually close, I have to have an anterior posterior compressive strategy that is closing that angle. As it closes, it goes up. The the human rib cage is is somewhat conical. Um, so so basically the scap rides up and the clavicle moves up and back. That angle gets closed. It gets very, very narrow. And so, when you think about like uh, upper upper dorsal rostral compression, you think about the manubrium being compressed down. So you're going to lose uh, if it, if the clavicle moves back, you're going to lose um, internal rotation behind the body, and you're going to and if the dorsal upper dorsal rostral gets compressed, you're going to lose end range overhead reach.